This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Michelle Crandall, Fremont, California, December 2006. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 28. René de l'Estorade to Louise de Macumer. December. My thrice happy Louise, your letter has made me dizzy. For a few moments I held it in my listless hands, while a tear or two sparkled on it in the setting sun. I was alone beneath the small barren rock where I have had a seat placed. Far off, like a lance of steel, the Mediterranean shone. The seat is shaded by aromatic shrubs, and I have had a very large jessamine, some honeysuckle and Spanish brooms transplanted there, so that some day the rock will be entirely covered with climbing plants. The wild vine has already taken root there. But winter draws near, and all this greenery is faded like a piece of old tapestry. In this spot I am never molested. It is understood that here I wish to be alone. It is named Louise's seat. A proof, is it not, that even in solitude I am not alone here? If I tell you all these details, to you so paltry, and try to describe the vision of green, with which my prophetic gaze clothes this bare rock, on which top some freak of nature has set up a magnificent parasol pine, it is because in all this I have found an emblem to which I cling. It was while your blessed lot was filling me with joy, and, must I confess it, with bitter envy, too, that I felt the first movement of my child within, and this mystery of physical life reacted upon the inner recesses of my soul. This indefinable sensation— which partakes of the nature at once of a warning, a delight, a pain, a promise, and a fulfillment. This joy, which is mine alone, unshared by mortal, this wonder of wonders, has whispered to me that one day this rock shall be a carpet of flowers, resounding to the merry laughter of children, that I shall at last be blessed among women, and from me shall spring forth fountains of life. Now I know what I have lived for, Thus the first certainty of bearing within me another life brought healing to my wounds. A joy that beggar's description has crowned for me those long days of sacrifice, in which Louis had already found his. Sacrifice, I said to myself, how far does it excel passion? What pleasure has roots so deep as one which is not personal but creative? Is not the spirit of sacrifice a power mightier than any of its results? Is it not that mysterious, tireless divinity, who hides beneath innumerable spheres, in an unexplored centre, through which all worlds in turn must pass? Sacrifice, solitary and secret, rich in pleasures only tasted in silence, which none can guess at, and no profane eye has ever seen. Sacrifice, jealous god and tyrant, god of strength and victory, exhaustless spring, which, partaking of the very essence of all that exists, can by no expenditure be drained below its own level. Sacrifice, there is the keynote of my life. For you, Louise, love is but the reflex of Philippe's passion. The life which I shed upon my little ones will come back to me in ever-growing fullness. The plenty of your golden harvest will pass. Mine, though late, will be the more enduring, for each hour will see it renewed. Love may be the fairest gem which society has filched from nature, but what is motherhood save nature in her most gladsome mood? A smile has dried my tears. Love makes my Louis happy, but marriage has made me a mother, and who shall say I am not happy also? With slow steps, then, I return to my white grange with the green shutters to write you these thoughts. So it is, darling, that the most marvellous— and yet the simplest process of nature has been going on in me for five months. And yet, in your ear let me whisper it, so far it agitates neither my heart nor my understanding. I see all around me happy. The grandfather-to-be has become a child again, trespassing on the grandchild's place. The father wears a grave and anxious look. They are all most attentive to me. All talk of the joy of being a mother. Alas, I alone remain cold and I dare not tell you how dead I am to all emotion. 
though I affect a little in order not to damp the general satisfaction. But with you I may be frank, and I confess that, at my present stage, motherhood is a mere affair of the imagination. Louis was to the full as much surprised as I. Does not this show how little, unless by his impatient wishes, the father counts for in this matter? Chance, my dear, is the sovereign deity in childbearing. My doctor, while maintaining that this chance works in harmony with nature, does not deny that children who are the fruit of passionate love are bound to be richly endowed both physically and mentally, and that often the happiness which shone like a radiant star over their birth seems to watch over them through life. It may be, then, Louise, that motherhood reserves joys for you which I shall never know. It may be that the feeling of a mother for the child of a man whom she adores, as you adore Philippe, is different from that with which she regards the offspring of reason, duty, and desperation. Thoughts such as these, which I bury in my inmost heart, add to the preoccupation only natural to a woman soon to be a mother. And yet, as the family cannot exist without children, I long to speed the moment from which the joys of family, where alone I am to find my life, shall date their beginning. At present I live a life all expectation and mystery, except for a sickening physical discomfort, which no doubt serves to prepare a woman for suffering of a different kind. I watch my symptoms, and in spite of the attentions and thoughtful care with which Louis' anxiety surrounds me, I am conscious of a vague uneasiness, mingled with the nausea, the distaste for food, and abnormal longings common to my condition. If I am to speak candidly, I must confess, at the risk of disgusting you with the whole business, to an incomprehensible craving for rotten fruit. My husband goes to Marseilles to fetch the finest oranges the world produces, from Malta, Portugal, Corsica, and these I don't touch. Then I hurry there myself, sometimes on foot, and in a little back street running down to the harbour, close to the town hall, I find wretched, half-putrid oranges, two for a sou, which I devour eagerly. The bluish-greenish shades on the mouldy parts sparkle like diamonds in my eyes. They are flowers to me. I forget the putrid odor and find them delicious, with a piquant flavor, and stimulating as wine. My dear, they are the first love of my life. Your passion for Philippe is nothing to this. Sometimes I can slip out secretly and fly to Marseilles, full of passionate longings, which grow more intense as I draw near the street. I tremble lest this woman should be sold out of rotten oranges. I pounce on them and then devour them as I stand. It seems to me an ambrosial food, and yet I have seen Louis turn aside, unable to bear the smell. Then came to my mind the ghastly words of Oberman in his gloomy elegy, which I wish I had never read. Roots slake their thirst in the foulest streams. Since I took to this diet, the sickness has ceased, and I feel much stronger. This depravity of taste must have a meaning, for it seems to be part of a natural process, and to be common to most women, sometimes going to most extravagant lengths. When my situation is more marked, I shall not go beyond the grounds, for I should not like to be seen under these circumstances. I have the greatest curiosity to know at what precise moment the sense of motherhood begins. It cannot possibly be in the midst of frightful suffering, the very thought of which makes me shudder. Farewell, favorite of fortune, farewell, my friend, in whom I live again, and through whom I am able to picture to myself this brave love, this jealousy all on fire at a look, these whisperings in the ear, these joys which create for women, as it were, a new atmosphere, a new daylight, fresh life. Ah, pet, I too understand love. Don't weary of telling me everything. Keep faithful to our bond. I promise in my turn to spare you nothing. Nay, to conclude in all seriousness, I will not conceal from you that, on reading your letter a second time, I was seized with a dread which I could not shake off. This superb love seems like a challenge to providence. Will not the sovereign master of this earth, Calamity, take umbrage if no place be left for him at your feast? What mighty edifice of fortune has he not overthrown? O oh, Louise, forget not, in all this happiness, your prayers to God. Do good, be kind and merciful. Let your moderation, if it may be, avert disaster. 
Religion has meant much more to me since I left the convent, and since my marriage. But your Paris news contains no mention of it. In your glorification of Philippe, it seems to me you reverse the saying, and invoke God less than his saint. But, after all, this panic is only excess of affection. You go to church together, I do not doubt, and do good in secret. The close of this letter will seem to you very primitive, I expect, but think of the too eager friendship which prompts these fears, a friendship of the type of La Fontaine's, which takes alarms at dreams, at half-formed, misty ideas. You deserve to be happy, since through it all you still think of me, no less than I think of you, in my monotonous life, which, though it lacks color, is yet not empty, and, if uneventful, is not unfruitful. God bless you, then. End of Letter 28